So last week, we began the conversation. It's actually my favorite conversation to have with anyone. What does it look like to become the person that God created you to be? And if we're going to be vulnerable to start this conversation, many of us get stuck in one of two places. One would be that place of, hey, we quit dreaming. Like back when we were a kid, it was natural, but now we're realists. And we find ourselves thinking, I just don't have time. I don't have energy. I don't have money. It just is what it is. And we stop dreaming. For others of us, we still have a dream. We're just not doing anything with it. We're not moving forward. We keep talking about, but we're not making progress in And so in this series, we're talking about what does it look like for you to be the person God created you to be, which means realizing your full potential. Imagine, imagine you fully realizing your God-given potential, how thrilling that will be. And in this conversation, there are some of you who may be a little skeptical about the conversation. Uh, Maybe you've been burnt before, or maybe you find yourself thinking, personality inventories, my goodness, why don't you all just leave the psychology to the psychologist and and stay away? So, hey, uh, I'm I'm with you. We're not going to move away from God's Word. We're not going to psychoanalyze you. For those of you who are students of the Bible, let let me slide a thought over your direction. As students, you know Mary and Martha. So two sisters, very different. What if Martha had known her personality? Because Jesus says to Martha, 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 you're worried about many things. Like she was a great organizer, a great servant. But she'd gotten so caught up in her personality, her strengths, that she was missing seeing Jesus. What if, by you understanding personality and gifts and those kind of things, you're able to better know who you are. Because when you better know who you are, made in the image of God, you'll actually know God more. And as you get to know each other, like have these conversations as parents, spouses, friends, small group stuff, as you see more people made in the image of God, realize more fully how God uniquely made them as a one in a trillion kind of a creation, it will lead you to worship the one who created them. So we're going to stick with God's Word, I promise. But these tools will help you in discovering who God has created you to be. So that's the journey that we're on. I hope you will get in completely. So let's, uh, let's jump into our study for today. We're in Genesis 39. And as we introduced last week, we're doing a study of the life of this guy named Joseph. And when we met him last week, we met him as a 17-year-old, and now for this installment, he's probably early 20s. So what did we find out about Joseph? Man, wow, what a story. He's the great-grandson of Abraham, like the man that God came to and said, I've chosen you to create a people to bless the entire world. And we know that ultimately that is fulfilled through Jesus. And here, Joseph gets to be in on it, seeing God's plan beginning to be fulfilled. He's not only the great-grandson of Abraham, he's the favorite son of Jacob, who is renamed Israel. What a beautiful gift to know that you are loved by your father. Joseph had that gift. And also he had an anointing of the Spirit of God on him so that at age 17, he is having prophetic dreams, prophetic visions where he actually sees the future. But as we talked about last week, Joseph didn't just have good things going for him. He had some baggage and some blind spots. Not only was he daddy's favorite, favoritism plagued their family. So there's this weird jealousy and this disastrous polygamy that going on was going on. So Joseph had three stepmoms at the same time. And there was this jealousy from his brothers to Joseph, his stupid coat that they hated that reminded them of that, that they, they couldn't even talk to him. They could not speak peacefully to him. They hated him. Well, 
Joseph not only had baggage, like he did nothing to deserve that. He did nothing to set that up. But because of the baggage, he had some blind spots. He wasn't paying attention to the fact his brothers already hated him when he tattled on them. He wasn't watching their body language when he went ahead and told them the dreams that he was having. He's like, guys, guys, you should have seen this dream. It was awesome. My bundle of wheat was standing up straight, and your 11 bundles of wheat were bowing down to me. They hated him even more, but he wasn't aware of it. He had blind spots, so he told them the next dream. Oh, yeah, this one was awesome. Like, I'm at the center of the story, and the sun, moon, stars, like, all y'all, and everybody's bowing down to me. He was clueless, which took him to the place where his brothers were like, we're done. And when they got their opportunity, when he was 65 miles away from Daddy-O, they said, let's kill him. They had a plan cold-blooded murder, and they only stopped short enough to sell their brother into slavery. And that's where we stopped the story. Now, as I told you last week, like our, our kids, our little ones, our big ones, our teenagers, like we're all doing this study together. And so Silas Rawls came out of elementary kids last week and went up to Nathan and said, Dad, they told us the story of Joseph but they left the story at a cliffhanger <laughs> because they told us we couldn't get ahead of the adults. So according to eight-year-old Silas Rawls, we're already holding the kids back. <laughs> so we got to get with it. Now we jump into 13 years. 13 years of difficulty. Maybe you're in one of those places where you feel like you've been hated, betrayed, sold out, violated, forgotten. These next two weekends are a gift from God, from his word to you. Like, what is God doing? God, where are you at? Or, or maybe it's not you. Maybe it's not your story right now, but you've not known what to say to your friend who's in one of those places. This is God's gift to your friend to be delivered by you. When we understand what was Joseph's experience and what God was up to, it positions us to discover freedom and victory even when we're in one of those 13-year seasons of our lives. And if I still don't have your attention, let me just tell you this. This section of Joseph's life proves sometimes you just have to run outside without your clothes on. <laughs> You're like, some of you know the story. For some of you, you're just like, what in the world is this thing going to happen? Okay, let's jump into the story. Verse 1 is the overlap. Verse 1 is the overlap from chapter 37. Remember, we left him. He got hauled off by slave traders, sold to Potiphar in Egypt. And as I, I read these verses, that phrase really stands out to me. Brought down, bought him, brought down. I mean, geographically, they were just moving west to east, land of Canaan over to Egypt. I guess topographically, they went down a little bit in elevation, but primarily, this is the trajectory of his life. He was set, and now his life is in shambles. He has been brought low. He has been bought. He's a slave. At the whim of his Egyptian master. That's where Joseph is. Now, verse 2, the new part of the story. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master, his master. So don't, don't lose that. He is a slave. He was bought. He still lives knowing that his past is of a family filled with brothers who so despised him, they wanted him dead and only stopped short enough to sell him into slavery. That is his past. Some of you know a past that has haunted you. Joseph could have stayed there. He could have stayed locked in to his past, but instead we find his present. And not only do we find Joseph's present, we find that the Lord is present. The Lord was with him. And also, we find that his master saw that the Lord was with him. 
Let's get our minds wrapped around that. God was with him in such a way that even though his situation had gotten worse, his experience was God being with him in his pit, in his slavery, in his just misery. God was there with him. And here's the promise of Scripture. When you come to know Jesus Christ as Lord, when you come to believe that God took on flesh to be our Savior, that Jesus died on the cross for you, he overcame sin and death for you, when you come to the place where you confess Jesus as Lord in in your life, you are indwelled with the Spirit of God. And the Bible teaches us in Ephesians 1 that you are indwelled with the Spirit of God in the way that you are permanently marked. He is your deposit guaranteeing you eternal life. You don't have to wonder about it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to wonder, okay, am I still saved? Will I always be saved? Look who's with you. When the Holy Spirit is in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will raise you too. You are victorious no matter where you find yourself. And when you understand that, when you know that, like really know that, it will change the way you pray. Because we've all been in a place where um, we've had a friend in a dark place, really struggling. And we've, we've prayed, God, be with her. Realize this. You need to step your prayer up a notch. What, what, what do I mean by that? When you know that your friend is a believer who's indwelled with the Spirit of God, Jesus has already promised her, I'll never leave you an orphan, never leave you or forsake you. You're indwelled with my Spirit. Where you go, I'm there because you're my child. It's almost as if you said to me, genuinely, "Um, Michael, please feed your children. You don't think I feed my kids? Now, they don't always get what they want, but I feed my family. You know, I, I feed my kids. But think about it. When you say, God, please be with her, he already promised he would. What if you stepped it up a notch? Like, I know what you're intending. What if you stepped it up a notch and you said, God, you have promised to be with her no matter what. Today, I'm asking that you would allow her to sense your presence. Lord, that she would feel safe that she would know you are her protector. God, I'm praying for my friend in this really difficult situation that he would sense the power of the Spirit of God come upon him. God, I'm asking that you would be so real, so present to them that they would know what you were doing. Instead of just, God, be with her, what if you prayed boldly? What if you prayed specifically You see, knowing that God goes with us as believers will change your expectation, and it just might change your prayers. It'll change your prayers for you. When you're not praying, God, please be with me, instead you're saying, God, remind me of my identity, that I am who you say I am, not what they're saying about me. God, remind me that I am filled with the Spirit of God. I'm already victorious before I even start this battle. You have already won this for me. Do you see how different it is? It's almost like that superhero who discovered his superpowers. It's like, whoa. That's the power of God in me. That's what Joseph's experience That is what is happening to Joseph. He is experiencing the presence, the powerful presence of God. And his boss sees it too. Now the interesting thing about this verse is, we don't know exactly how Potiphar is reconciling this. Like he sees the presence of the Lord on Joseph. Does that mean he's become a believer? Not necessarily. Does it mean that he believes Joseph's God is the one true and living God? Maybe, maybe not. Has he come to faith? Probably not. But he's a sharp dude. Who's Potiphar? He's captain of the guard. Think director of Homeland Security or chief of police or maybe head of Pharaoh's bodyguard. 
We're not sure exactly his role as captain of the guard, but he is an entrusted, proven leader for Pharaoh. And what does he know? Joseph's got it going on. And he's beginning to trust Joseph with more and more responsibility. He is blessed. Here's an incredible promise. When God is in you, when God's anointing rests upon you, other people experience a blessing. God blesses other people through you. Like, we know that God's promise to Abraham would ultimately be fulfilled in Jesus. Through you, I will bless all people. All people will be invited to salvation. But penultimately, prior to Jesus' ultimate fulfillment, we see Joseph being a blessing to his boss, and you can be a blessing to your boss. You can be a blessing to your fellow students and workers and neighbors. You can be a blessing. God wants to be moving in you in such a way that other people see the presence of God, and they are blessed by the person that you are becoming. That's what Potiphar saw. Whatever he gave Joseph turned out well, so he just kept giving him more and more, and more. Look at the next verse. He left all that he had in Joseph's charge. The director of Homeland Security has now entrusted everything to Joseph because he realizes Joseph does it well. Why would I even mess with it? Joseph would do it better than me. Because of him, he had no concern. That phrase literally means not a speck. He had not a speck of concern, not a worry in his day. The only thing he woke up wondering was, what should I eat today? Can you imagine? That was his life. What am I going to eat today? Because Joseph had been such a blessing to him. What if God uses you like that, like Joseph, in your area of influence in life? He can. He wants to as we more and more realize fully our God-given potential. Oh, there's one more piece about Joseph we need to know. It's imperative to the story. The last part of verse 6 tells us that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And in verse 7, over time, Potiphar's wife laid eyes on him, began to notice him. So let's, let's talk about this man, handsome in form and appearance. Our, our team did some study, and we found out there are only two other men in the entire Bible who are described in this way. Only two others. King David and King David's oldest son, Absalom. So there are only three men in the entirety of Scripture, including Joseph, who are described in this way. And so our team's like, how do we describe this? Like, how do we, what what would we call this? And the phrase we came up with was this. Joseph was a pretty boy. (laughs) Now, now it's important, you know what we're trying to say. Do not think tough, rough, rugged, long beard, flannel shirt wearing lumberjack. That was not Joseph. He was a pretty boy. Uh, If you need like a modern day image, think model for Abercrombie and Fitch. Something like that. Young, slender. He probably had a six pack. I never had one of those. But anyway, we we won't be bitter. He had a six pack like he was a good looking dude. Good looking dude. And now as we said, he's probably in his early 20s. Early 20s. And over time, That's important. Don't don't immediately think, Potiphar's wife, good grief, she's such a stalker and she's such a horrible person. I I, I don't know. The, The Bible tells us over time that she cast her eyes upon him. She noticed. It's like, wow, man, Joseph is good looking. Here's the part of the Joseph story that became the most famous. This part of the story, Potiphar's wife and Joseph, was picked up by storytellers back in that day and actually picked up by other religions where they added all these alternative endings and explanations. The Bible doesn't tell us 
where those storytellers take the story. But here's what we know. Potiphar's wife, the man Joseph works for, cast her eyes on Joseph, and she began to proposition him actively and then aggressively. Here's Joseph's response. You are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Let's stop there. Joseph says, ma'am, your husband has given me everything. I can have anything. I control everything. He's not even greater than me because he's given me everything. Except you. You're his wife. No way. Here, Joseph is so faithful to his boss, his slave owner, that he says, no way could I violate the trust my boss has given me. No way. And in so doing, engage in an act that would be a direct sin against my God. It would be, it would be wicked. So, so catch what's happening inside of Joseph. He's saying, I so desire to please my God, to be faithful to my boss, but even bigger, to please my God, to be holy, that what would be pleasurable in this sexual escapade pales in comparison to honoring my God. Incredible response. Incredible response. But she doesn't stop. She doesn't say, oh, okay, I, I, I respect that about you. She keeps at it to where it says, and as she spoke to Joseph day after day, like he works there, he would not listen to her, lie beside her, or be with her. Imagine what she's saying to him. Imagine how she's telling him, he's attractive and what they could do. And then she must have said something like, hey, we could, we could just lie down together and snuggle. And she says to him, hey, there's nobody in the other room. We, 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 we could go over there. I mean, imagine. He's in his early 20s. Raging hormones. Good-looking dude, long way from home, he could have easily said to himself, you know what, I deserve a break after all of this. God will forgive me. What's the big deal? It's just once. I mean, she's my boss's wife. Isn't that kind of like a command from my boss? I mean, there were so many angles he could have worked. But instead he said, he said no. Like, no, no. He wouldn't listen to her, wouldn't snuggle with her, wouldn't set up being alone with her. I, I love in our team discussion, Jay added, think about it. Joseph not only knows all the workers' schedules, like who's scheduled to be here and there and that so he could work around them. He set the schedules. He could have so easily had everybody in a different place so that no one would know. I mean, who's it going to hurt? Who's it going to hurt? And Joseph realized that it would be wickedness. And more than he wanted a moment with a woman that may have been very, very attractive, he wanted to please his God. Now, think about those two pieces. What's really going on? What's really going on in Joseph? In verse 9, we see self-control. In verse 10, we see boundaries. This is your path to victory. Self-control, boundaries. Here's the good news. When you are indwelled with the Spirit of God, like when you accept Jesus as your Savior, when you come to know Him as Lord of your life, you are indwelled with the Spirit. We talked about that. With the Spirit of God comes the power of God. Think superhero, discovering the new power you have. There are things you can say no to because of the Spirit of God that used to be 
You couldn't stop yourself. You couldn't shut it off. You couldn't stop that line of thinking. You just could not pull yourself away from it. But now, and dwelled with the Spirit of God, you have power over sin. Galatians 5 says, when we walk in the Spirit, when we orient our lives around the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. God sets you free. It's awesome. It's awesome. And as you walk in the Spirit, you'll be more and more and more filled with the power of God to say no. No. Second piece, boundaries. Boundaries. These are healthy habits. These are guardrails. These are the things you do to position you to walk in the Spirit. These are the things that are your responsibility to put in place to make sure you don't find yourself in a compromising situation. Trust the Spirit of God to give you victory. And be wise. Be wise to not place yourself in circumstances that it would be so easy to cross the line. Because let me warn you, as excited about following Jesus, as empowered by the Spirit as you are right now, there will be days that you're tired, that you don't care, that you think to yourself, nobody will know and God will forgive me. And it's those boundaries that you have put in place that keep you out of a situation where you would go down the wrong path. And you got to know you. Like, what are the boundaries that you need? What are the changes that need to happen in your life? I'll give you a couple little examples from mine. Fifteen years ago, I was not healthy. I was not physically healthy. Um, about 13 years ago, I had tongue cancer. And over about a 12, 15-year period, I have changed the way I eat. Changed the way I eat. So I'm 25 pounds lighter than I was at 35. I am healthier than I was at 35. But it took putting some boundaries in place. So I have a certain eating schedule. Uh, I have certain things I eat, which requires food preparation. You just can't drive through and get what I have chosen to eat. And there are certain foods I can't have in my house. Do you have any of those? Like if they're in your house, you just can't say no? I have those. So I win the war at the grocery store, not in my house. Healthy boundaries. Does God give me victory? Yes, absolutely. But healthy boundaries. Uh, another one, like here's a weakness of mine. I get up early for a lot of things. There's one thing I can't get up early for, exercise. So I turned 50 this fall, and, and a couple months ago I said to my wife, I want one thing for my birthday this year. One thing. Um, you have this amazing superpower. Like when the alarm goes off, you just get out of bed. I don't. Um, for my birthday, and I'm asking that we would start a month early, because you know you're like sore for the first three weeks of exercising. I'm asking that at least a month before my birthday, you would set your alarm and just start flipping on the light at the predetermined time. And guess what? It's working. It's working. We're exercising again. W what are yours? What are yours? Like, what's the app you need to delete? What's the software you need on your phone? What's the place that there's nothing sinful about going there or that group? You just can't go. Now, two out of three times, maybe even nine out of ten, you're good. But that one out of ten, one out of three, once in a while, it just goes wrong. Do you know what Jesus said about that? He said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. He was using a hyperbole, an exaggeration, an illustration with exaggeration to make effect. What was he saying? Cut off something good to keep you away from that which is evil. Just, just cut it off. What is the step you need to take to cut off something that you've said, oh, it's good, it's not bad, it's not, it's not really sin for me to have that or do that. or you know, Okay, but if one out of ten, one out of three, once in a while, 
it takes you down a path of sin. Just cut it off. Be done with it. Be set free. And this is where the soundtrack of the movie begins. Like the victory chant. The victory music. He did the right thing and God rewards him. Nope. I told you 13 years. We know the end of the story. We know Operation Storehouse is coming. We know at 30, there is this radical change. But right now, we're still in between 17 and 30. 13 years of difficulty. So what does he get for his spiritual purity? What does he get from his guardrails and healthy habits? What does he get? He gets accused of sexual assault. What? What? He was even polite, ma'am. You're married to my boss. It, he didn't cast shade on her, didn't call her any names. He simply tied it to his obedience to God and her husband. And what does she do? She accuses him of sexually assaulting her. So what happened was there was a time that Joseph found himself with Potiphar's wife and nobody else was around. And she came up beside him and grabbed his coat and demanded intimate relationship with him. He knew there was no win in this argument, so he just took off, leaving her hanging on to his coat, which is why sometimes you just got to run outside with your, without your clothes on. So there she stands with his coat, furious, furious with the man who now quite dramatically turned her down. And she had the proof she needed to accuse him to her husband. And so she told Pilate, this Hebrew servant of yours, this man you brought into our house, tried to sexually assault me. And when he did, I got hold of his coat. He ran out the door and this proves it. That's a really funny proof. I, but she had it. And she had Pilate backpedaling. This man you brought into our home. And so Pilate responds to the accusation his wife made about his key servant. And here it is. Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison. What did Joseph get? Not just accused. He got condemned. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And we're reminded, it's not where I am, it's who's with me. We introduced these questions last week. Like, what is Joseph's experience? Hated, sold, in prison. What's God doing? God is doing an incredible work in Joseph. Like he's, he's revolutionizing his character. He's growing him up. He's preparing him to have a world-changing role in Egypt and for his relatives. But Joseph's experience feels like Groundhog Day. It's like, good grief. Chapter 37, my brothers hate me and sell me into slavery. Chapter 39, Potiphar hates me and throws me into prison. Or, I just have some issue with clothing. Chapter 37, my coat gets ripped off of me and I get thrown into slavery. Now, my, my coat gets ripped off of me and I get thrown into prison. I've got to get a new style. Like, what is wrong with my... It, it just feels like Groundhog Day. And yet, Joseph knew. Joseph knew the Lord was with him. Joseph knew. What a challenge for you and me to be more focused on who is with us than where we're at. Will you accept God's invitation to hear that from him today? To be more concerned about who is with us than where we're at. Because we know that oftentimes our experience doesn't fully explain God's plan. 
Jesus on the cross alone, does that explain anything? Nope. Until you know the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Until you realize that on the cross, falsely accused, falsely condemned, hated by self-righteous jerks, he willingly stretched out his arms, allowed them to crucify him so we could be saved. One of our favorite Bible verses is God works all things together for the, for the good, to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. The next verse defines what's good, that we would look more like Jesus. You see, it, it's a lot more, what is God doing, who is with you, than where you're at. And when you and I get locked in on that, it will change the way we pray. It will give us power and boldness, no matter what situation we're in. And it will grow our faith for us, our kids, our friends, because we know that our experience doesn't fully explain what God is doing. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for the revealing through your word and by your spirit today. Spirit of God, I pray that you would bring us to a place of sensing peace, knowing that you, O oh God, are in control. Power, knowing that you, Spirit of the living God, are in us, giving us victory over sins that once laid, laid hold of us. God, that we would grow in our faith to trust that our circumstances don't tell the whole story, that you are good, we can trust you, that you are using all things to make us more like Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for being willing to suffer so that we could be saved. Lord Jesus, today, we willingly embrace suffering so we can more fully follow you. To the glory of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.